How's it going there, everybody? This is Samuel Fisher from Green Dispensary Marketing. I'm back again with another podcast guest. I'm very excited to talk with Arnau. Uh, he's actually based in Barcelona, or Barcelona, you might pronounce it in English. Um, and he's got some really good information regarding data in the cannabis industry. And so he's the founder of Canna Monitor. And he's got some really good insights. I'm really excited to talk with him, learn more about what he does, help him get some more exposure. So let, let's, let's break this down. Uh, real quick, Art, now, can you tell me a little bit more about what you do and who you are? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me, Samuel. It's it's a pleasure. And um, I guess to, to summarize it, I've been involved in the space since 2018, which is when in Europe everything was starting to get uh, started on the legal side of things, of course. And I've been working since then helping companies with their di- data and the market entry strategy in for for their commercial activities focused on europe but nowadays i'm focusing more and more in other international markets for instance now with the rescheduling in the us i'm also very interested in in that so keeping 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 a look in the at the international market all around the world and so so i'm curious though given that you're you're located in europe um it hasn't been the most cannabis friendly climate past 10 years or so. So why cannabis? Why didn't you go into a different niche? Just curious. Yeah, good question. Uh, even though it's true that on the legal side of things, Europe has been slow to to get started and regulations, you know, uh, go at, at a snail pace, let's say. I, I am a native from Barcelona and here the underground culture and the gray market, let's say, is completely massive and has been for for decades. So when I was uh, very young, I started growing since I was like uh, 14 years old in the in the mountain. Um, so I, I really enjoyed cannabis. Then I was um, I started my career working in pharmaceuticals and CPG, doing market research and other type of things. But when I got the opportunity to merge a passion of mine, which was cannabis already, with uh, my knowledge on the on the legal side of things uh, for uh, producing intelligence and producing market research for clients i thought that it was a match made in heaven so i jumped uh, right in and still still going strong six years after yeah so let's break this down so i was looking at your website it looks really interesting and so you offer data-driven insights you offer market research and you also offer consulting services um, can you break those down a little bit more for me uh, describe in detail kind of uh, your ideal client what you what you do together uh, that sort of stuff yeah absolutely so essentially what i do is i maintain these huge databases on the global market so i have databases for like uh, products in the different markets producers uh, distributors uh, and all sorts of of data let's say that then i can I can use to customize uh, certain projects for for specific clients. So I've done uh, like literally uh, a ton of things because the market is so fragmented. Even now, as you know, with CBD and medicinal and recreational and accessories and technology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But let's say the the typical work that I do is with a medical cannabis grower that is ramping up their operations, maybe they already have some products in the market or maybe they are trying to to launch them and I kind of help them figure out uh, where they can sell and what they can do in order to to sell better so this this includes you know pointing them in the direction of the the suitable distributors that they can reach in places like Germany and the UK which are now the largest markets in in Europe on the legal, medicinal side of things and also in terms of like portfolio optimization so which type of products uh, they should be actually growing and how should they present their their products in the marketplace like what what should their marketing activities be and and this type of thing so as a summary it would be helping medical cannabis cultivators sell more through the use of data and intelligence but then this uh, which is part of what i like uh, i end up doing so so many different things Interesting. So let's break this down one by one. And so let's let's start off with uh, data driven insights. This is one of your major service offerings. Up, uh, can you explain a little bit more about what that means? Uh, just for you know the stupid people like me who are like, hey, what's the what's a data driven insight? 
I mean, it, of course, it, it it depends on on the on the different markets and etc. But for instance, uh, something that is that is very uh, very straightforward. When you look at which products are actually selling, for instance, I I get some some companies that come to me saying I'm developing this. Uh, balanced uh, flower products to to launch into the market. So where where should I be able to where where can I launch these products? No, and then I can tell them uh, you know which distributors have a have a, um, a gap in their portfolio for this sort of products. But I can also tell them that actually most of what is being sold, same as in the states, actually is like high THC products. Therefore, and you can also command higher prices for these super high THC products. So, for instance, a, a, a data-driven insight might be if you want to be really successful in the German market right now, yes, there's a, a variety of different things that you can do, but the most obvious one would be have some products with some nice high THC and be able to launch them in the market. That would be, uh, for instance, an obvious one. But then there's so many other things and you can get into the nuances of the different varietal selection, or even from the point of view of production um, production methods and, and your process and how to display actually for uh, your process to the to the clients in order to get differentiated, you know, because for instance in in Europe everything is very much pharmaceutical they call it so you need to be EU GMP which this is good manufacturing practices as if you were producing uh, medicines so then everybody wants to lead with that. Which is, of course, it's uh, it's it's necessary. But what's the thing? Everybody that has products in the market is uh, because it's uh, it's mandatory. Is has that that high level of compliance. So that's you know necessary, but it's not enough in terms of how you communicate your value proposition in the market. You need to add some other some other things. Yeah. So well, let's let's dive into this a little bit more. So say a client comes to you. Say they're an investor. They have this cool idea. Um, and they're coming to you and kind of asking for your advice um, before jumping into it. What, what kind of data do you think you would present to them first um, to be the most important in helping them make the most informed decision? Great question. And this is actually a very a very typical case. And this is something that I've, I've done a, a lot of times, particularly a few years ago. But even now, there's still a lot of projects that are coming up in in like portugal or in spain that they want to start producing and the main thing is because you think uh, if you just search into google for instance where can i sell my legal cannabis products you'll get uh, a variety of answers maybe they'll tell you oh the united states is 80 percent of the global market which is completely true but what's the thing as you are well aware it's it's not federally legal, therefore you cannot ship products in the United States and uh, the Americans cannot uh, ship products legally to Europe, you know, so yeah. that's out of the question, out of the, it's not, it's not possible. So essentially that, that's the first thing, like which markets have a regulatory situation where you can actually, you know, trade with them and then what type of products are actually being sold in this market and what's the structure of distribution there. Because, for instance, another example would be Canada is the largest federally legal cannabis market in the world, yes, but they have a ban on imports. So the Canadians export to Europe, but they do not import any cannabis. Therefore, if, if my client in Portugal, you know, they want to, uh, he wants to have an idea of where will, will he actually send their products, it's going to be Germany, the UK, Australia, Poland maybe, Brazil as an emerging market or Israel and then there's a lot more small markets but let's say selecting the markets and selecting the the type of relationships that you can set up like it's not the same if you want to enter with your own brand and therefore you need to either acquire or you know have a partnership with a distributor there or you wanna you are you are willing to white label your products in the market or you can as well acquire the genetic portfolio and the branding rights for you know maybe a, a reputable breeder or reputable brand from the states. So there's a variety of options that, of course, depends on on a thousand things, and that's what's uh, funny about it on defining your own uh, trailblazing your own path in the in the market. Yeah, re really good answer. I had a follow up question to kind of help you break down how you would use data to fix um, an issue. That, I think that was a really good answer. Um, I was checking out your website. 
Um, it's Canon Monitor is the name of the company. Um, and so he does these monthly reports. And so I got this from his June 2024 brief. And so here's some of the data that he shares. Up to 12% of Germans use cannabis weekly and 17% occasionally. And in Germany, 54% of Gen Zs are weekly or occasional consumers. Uh, 25 million units of cannabis products are sold in Michigan each month. Each month. Oregon prices are the lowest in the U.S. at about $3.60 per G or gram. And in the U.S., 20% of pregnant women use CBD for anxiety. Um, I think this is really telling right now. So, so if you were, um, say, for example, you were trying to get into the German market, and you're looking at this data right here. It says 54% of Gen Zs are weekly or occasional consumers. It gives you a pretty good idea right from the jump whether or not it's a good idea to get into the market. So just wanted to commend you and shout you out on that. It's really good research, really good data. Oh, man. Moving on now uh, to your market research services, can you describe a little bit more about your market research services? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the question. This would be an ad hoc service where I get uh, a client that has usually a very specific question, uh, and then I need to find a way to collect the uh, data which is usually proprietary data that doesn't exist previously, so I need to generate it by conducting surveys or by doing a web scraping process or by collecting secondary information. It can also be correlating different data sets that exist on the, are already existing, but are uh, uncorrelated and you need to, to merge them together or make sense of them. So it's conducting this, this sort of ad hoc, bespoke, uh, tailored analysis for a, for a particular client. And for instance, recently I got, uh, because you mentioned the, the German thing, I got the, the question of what's the seed market for, because now, as you know, since April 1st, cannabis is legal in Germany. So there, there has been a big rush in all the different verticals of, of the cannabis market, but particularly in the home growing supplies so the cultivation of which wasn't that typical in germany because it's kind of cloudy it's not the the super best weather of the within within europe but now there's there's a ton of interest no so i have to look at okay how is this market actually shaping up you know and this data is not generated because it's something that only exists for for three months so i had to design uh, a research process in order to deliver insights to my client that actually can help him uh, make decisions in terms of uh, what package, uh, you know, should he sell the seeds uh, ten, uh, in packs of 10 or in packs of 1 or in packs of 3? Should he focus more on feminized varieties, autoflorine varieties, uh, regular varieties? Should he uh, bring classical European varieties from the Netherlands like uh, White Widow or should he bring the newest hybrids from California? You know, so all these type of things that are really operational, like it allows you to to make actionable uh, decisions is where I where I focus I focus, and it's super uh, you know laser focus on answering specific questions. For yeah, the well, I have an idea for you. I don't know if you're actually familiar. I used to work as a content manager for one of these big verticals for these seed companies, and in, in the USA, um, one of the biggest drivers of income for these seed companies is something called parasite SEO. Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. Yeah, well, maybe let Google it. And so basically, it's just like using sponsored posts um, on big platforms to market the seed companies. Might just be you know, another service you could offer. Um, and so let's keep talking about this market research. Let's break it down. So let's. What is a typical client who comes to you asking for market research look like? And so is it a seed company? Um, do you also work with the CBDs, the cannabis? Um, what, what is a typical client? And what do they typically ask for right from the job? Yeah, so most of my of the of the work I do is usually like I told you before with the medical medical producers or medical brands that essentially want to bring products to market on the medicinal side of things. But then it's true that for the for the more ad hoc research, I also get a lot of action from CBD companies, as you said, because it has the same as in the States. When you trade in in ham, you have the advantage that you can cross state lines, etc. So in Europe, it's the same. So even though there's no specific law in most countries re uh, regulating CBD or ham, you have a, a working market with a lot of difference in every market. But essentially, 
you can you can trade it uh, throughout the throughout the continent no? and therefore brands can expand and can diversify to different product formats or different niches or different demographics as as you mentioned before no? it's not the same if you if you uh, target uh, old people versus gen z or flour versus oils this or or pharmacies versus tobacco shops you know there's um, it's, it's a very, very complex uh, scenario. So this is something that I do. And also, in particular, with the, the seed companies, I put uh, in a similar category as sort of the accessory companies in terms of like vaporizers or, or even like technology companies. So for instance, uh, North American providers of extraction equipment or cultivation supplies you know, these this brands also have an interest to expand their distribution in, in Europe and they, they do not trade in regulated products, in controlled substances. Therefore, they can reach, uh, you know, they have multiple um, channels, commercial channels that they can target and they can, gener they can generally distribute throughout the, throughout the whole continent. So they, they usually need help uh, figure out what are their options and how do they differ because it's literally, you know, it's like like the states, the whole of Europe, but let's say there's even greater differences between the what the different uh, countries allow or do not allow. Yeah, really good information. Um, and just one more question on market research before I move on. Um, and so, as you're doing market research for a client, um, what boxes do you need to check, or what what lights do you need to light up? What what are what are the signals uh, that you see um, to know if a market's right for a client? Good question. I mean, in part, there's also um, there's always a, a competitive landscape assessment. That is, if there are companies that are in your same niche and they are already involved in the market, this means that, of course, it's it's possible to to enter the market. And generally, I may add that because you may think, no, if there are competitors, this means that the market is maybe saturated. So perhaps I'm not interested in in going there. But usually in cannabis, because it's always it's such a new industry. I, I I would say this is rarely the case because there's always uh, you know a complementary strategy that you can take or uh, you know maybe there's a, an important brand that is focused on selling CBD in the pharmacies, but they haven't targeted you know natural stores for instance. So there are these opportunities in certain in a specific niches that uh, that are available and i think this this more focused insights you know i'm i'm really gonna say uh, no you cannot enter uh, in the french market or it's not worth it no it's more on the nuance and the detail of how you should do it and where you should um, focus more than uh, which is, is usually very different country to country as well yeah good answer uh, really good answer um and let's let's go ahead and move on so we have one more topic just like five more questions um, so if you can bear with me for five more questions, I'd, I'd really love to talk more about your consulting services. And so can you tell me a little bit more about what those are and what exactly you do regarding consulting services? Yeah, so let's say in the in the case of a market research report or an intelligence, let's say a, a market research, the deliverable is usually a report that then the client needs to do the implementation of the conclusions or the insights uh, themselves. Uh, in the case of, of market intelligence, it can be, for instance, a database, and maybe we might agree on the fact that this is an ongoing database, for instance, uh, potential uh, clients in a certain market, and as, as new uh, companies are become online, you know, this database gets updated. In the case of consulting, there's a little bit more hand-holding and you know a specialized uh, more tailored implementation of the of the of the projects of the of the client so this may include for instance introductions to certain distributors that i know in the market or it may include some help uh, in creating certain materials for instance for for fundraising and business plan etc uh, etc et this is uh, i would say this is a, a, an important use case where they really need usually this this sort of it's not um uh, i cannot tell you how to how to create your business plan i we we need to do it 
uh, together, you know, and then I be, I I get uh, involved directly on the on the project as if he was a, a, an employee of the company, but with a very specific scope with certain goals. So I always work like this. I I don't sell my time. I sell my solution. So what you're gonna get for for a certain engagement, and this is defined beforehand. Uh, so then we know what's the metric of success. And to be honest, until now we've had like 100% uh, success rate. So I'm I'm very happy about that. You know, congratulations on that. It's a just a quick follow up. But what's the typical advice that you usually give? It's uh, so say somebody comes to you. What's the what's the most common piece of advice that you would give to people? Yeah, I mean. Uh, of course, the, the point is not, not for it to be cookie cutter so that it can be uh, different uh, company to company to what, to what they need. But to mention some of the, let's say, typical mistakes uh, that, that maybe I, I see a lot of company, a lot of company that do, uh, one would be the fact of becoming uh, very stretched in their, in their different goals. So, for instance, uh, you know, I work with a company that wants to do breathing and they want not only to do the breathing, but do the propagation themselves, but then they also want to be themselves cultivators, but they also want to have uh, a retail and, and their own brand, a retail front and their own brand. You know, they want to become, which of course it's a, it's a long-term play that makes a lot of sense, vertical integration and you know, multi-stage operator in the in the US, uh, they do that. But usually at the beginning, of course, I would say that you need to focus both in terms of the vertical, uh, in, in terms of the supply chain, but also in terms of uh, horizontally. So for instance, for some now it's I'm seeing in the US, a lot of the marijuana players are shifting to also produce uh, selling hemp because uh, they, you know, THC hemp derived uh, beverages and this sort of thing. Um, but you know they started with the marijuana. It's not like at the when they uh, when they launched their products, they launched everything at once. No, you first become very good at one thing, and then you can expand your your offering. So this this is usually what I um, some of the insights that that I find myself repeating uh, once uh, once and, and again is is this sort of thing. Yeah. No, I think that's really good advice. And so I think really to summarize is niching down and getting good at one thing before branching out to 500 things is really, um, it's a really good piece of advice. Honestly, as I say, riches are in the niches. Um, but yeah, I have one, actually, I had a couple follow-ups, but I think you did a really good job answering these questions to the point where we can kind of just move on. Um, do you have a kind of a last minute pitch before we move on to some fun questions? Uh, why, why should people work with Canon Monitor? What makes you guys stand out? Yeah, I think it's the fact that um, in in this industry there's been a lot of um, a lot of hype sometimes. So again, you search something uh, to Google and you'll find a thousand different pages claiming different things. Like all the information is very muddy and um, it's hard to re to uh, to get actual hard data on the on the different topics. And I think what uh, from from kind of monitor is the merging industry expertise and having a you know good good experience in the market with also solid methodological approach and you know explaining always what's the source of the data and how this data has come about and i think when when you merge that you get something that is uh, solid insights on the on the market and you know no fluff no no bs i'm not here to hype any you know many many service providers are, are pr companies in disguise as well so you know they they give out uh, market sizing estimates on demand i'm not into that business at all my business is helping my client this is why i only get get paid by whoever needs that the intelligence and uh, yeah ensuring that they can get uh, then they can get results with the uh, with the data. Awesome. But yeah, once again, this is Arnau Baldovinos. Um, he's the the founder of Canon Monitor. I'll leave all his links information in the, the the description below. Um, just a few more fun questions for you, Arnau, while we have you on the call. Um, what do you think? Uh, looking into your crystal ball, what do you think is the future for the cannabis industry? I, 
I think on the on the short term and the mid term is not as bright as some would like to to paint it in the sense of um, now it's maybe not as common, but a few years ago everybody thought about very fast legalization. So you read the business plans of companies and they assumed that you know the US would become federally legal in 2020 and then Germany in 2021 and you know one after another. Other. So I think this is pro this process is going to be a little bit more messy and take uh, a few uh, take longer. But then when you think of the long term, I'm even more more bullish than than what's the the usual. And I'm I'm seeing some trends like this, um, hemp beverages in the U.S. that really can bring the market size. You know, not only the 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 joints and the concentrates that that we might think as the traditional cannabis uh, market but also expand it to cosmetics and cpg and you know expand the the commercial channels to alcohol and traditional storefronts so i think when you think of, think of it in this in this framework like 20 to 30 years from now i think that cannabis is going to be a massive industry globally um there's we are only we are we are just barely scratching the surface like all of Africa and Asia barely has anything in terms of cannabis and they are over half, half of the population of the world, for instance. So I see massive opportunity also in the markets that are already open in Europe and North America. Latin America is super exciting with like markets like Brazil, you know, 200 million uh, inhabitants and they already have like half a million people uh, consuming CBD. So massive potential. Uh, there, so I'm I'm very excited to be here on the on the long on the long term, and I but I think that in the in the meantime, you know, there's a lot of hard work and a lot of uh, pains that that will need to be overcome in the in the meantime. So this is why I think it's super exciting, and I'm I'm up for the ride. I love the prediction. Uh, but let's talk about a little bit more about you personally. What what? Tell me about the first time you used cannabis. Yeah, like I like I told you, like twenty years ago when I was very young, it was pretty ubiquitous in my in my milieu. So I was probably fourteen years old. I was hanging around at night with some friends, and somebody probably just uh, you know was passing it around, and I and I tried it. Um, so yeah, that that was. Did you feel it the first time? Oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> and actually, it's like well, you know, because because it's it really. F I don't know about you, but for me, you really felt I could feel it in a in a different way, you know, back then, and it, it wasn't tested, so I know what what THC percentage. But I remember some varieties. It was like a very classic Thai was very prevalent uh, back then, so it was probably not that high THC, maybe fifteen percent or something. But still, probably because because of how young we were and and how and the fact that we didn't have any tolerance, it was really, you know, quite, quite the experience. Now I, I, you know, I, I don't get as high anymore. I, I, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, I'm with you there. I kind of like, one with the tolerance, the two just getting older. It's just like, yeah, oh, yeah, it's not not quite as fun as it used to be when you're younger, but still great for health reasons and mental health, that sort of stuff. Pain, I have chronic pain, for example. Uh, but back to you, what's your favorite cannabis product? My favorite cannabis product actually doesn't exist, or at least here is not that uh, it's not that prevalent. But I. You know, when I was young, maybe I, I wanted these potent varieties that would get me super stoned. But now I use mostly CBD. But I find that when there's a little bit of THC, still, I I really like it. So you know, I would I would really like to see in the in the future these you know pre rolls of like maybe uh, three to one CBD to THC ratio, something like this. You know, something that will get me won't get me super high but will help me unwind after a long day um and, and also mostly on the on the babe sides I'm, i think there's I'm, I'm seeing i'm looking at the progress in the stage with the rosins and this this concentrated babes I'm, I'm very excited about that and i i look forward to seeing it in europe as well yeah well thanks again this is once again this is our now uh, from canna monitor gonna leave all his information 
uh, below if you want to get in touch with him. Uh, but thanks for talking with me, Arnau. It's been it's been a pleasure. Uh, I'm really excited to kind of continue to watch you grow, and definitely wish you all the best. Absolutely, Samuel. It's been a pleasure, and thanks so much for the opportunity. Have a nice day. You as well.